you know, what about the regular commute and what are his options? Um, so, another question. How many of you here live in Alabama? Raise up your hands, keep your hands up. Alabama, how about Quezon City and Valenzuela? Keep your hands up, guys. Oh, a lot more. Okay, so let me ask you. Keep your hands up, keep your hands up. All right. How many of you have thought two times or even three times about dating someone who lives on the other side of Metro Manila? <laughs> <laughs> right? And if you, meet, you did meet that person in the end, after thinking so hard, that you actually decided to date that person. And if that's true, was it true love and did you guys get married? All right, because do, making that decision to date someone on the other side of the Metro is a long distance relationship. Yes. Right? <laughs> And this is not only, I'm not only talking about relationships, I'm talking about school, I'm talking about your careers, right? So I have a young son at home and I've been searching for a good school to send him to. Um, and, you know, I, I did a talk with a, a, at a, an event once at the school and I found the school to be really progressive, you know, the principal was really cool. And I was like, yes, you know, this might be the school I'm going to send my son to. And I was super excited. And I got home and I was like, oh, wait a minute. Let me Google where the school is. So unfortunately, the school is uh, you know, near Ateneo. And uh, I'm still looking for a school right now. So if you guys have any suggestions, please let me know. Um, you know so you know, we are making choices now on you know, where do our kids go to school based, on, based because of the, on the commute, not because of the merits of the school itself. Right? And that's schools. How about your careers? You know, when I first started interviewing for jobs for Akas, uh, a lot of people were like, oh, you know, uh, where are we going to be going? Where is the office? I didn't, I didn't understand at that point why it was so important for people to ask that during, um, uh, during the interviews. In fact, when we moved offices, I actually had people resign <laughs> because now there were like insufferable commutes forced upon them and they were like, hey, I'm sorry, ma'am, I, I just can't. <laughs> during the commute, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's not practical. So they left. And, um, you know, I'm sure this is something that all of you, in fact, you know, everyone in this room, you understand what I'm talking about, right? Because you live that on a daily basis. So I'd like to share a heartbreaking but very real story about what a regular commuter goes through. Um, so this was during our you know, um, the time where we self-suspended our service and uh, we had a hearing with the LTFRB and her name was Sam. So Sam took time from a busy schedule to come share her story with the LTFRB. Um, so Sam works in, uh, lives in Antipolo and she works in Ortega Center. Every day, Sam wakes up at 4.30 in the morning um, to try and get to work at 9 a.m. Sometimes she gets in late at 9.30 and she gets deducted for tardiness. Um, and then she leaves work around 6 p.m. and she gets home at 11 p.m. Right? And then she wakes up again at 4.30 in the morning and rinses and repeat. The problem here is that Sam was a single mom. And I consider her an OFW in her own city and her own country. Right. I mean, you know, I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about the fact that she's living in Mindanao and she's working in Manila. She's working in Metro Manila, right? And this is a distance of not more than 10 kilometers, right? And she, because of work, because of traffic, she doesn't have time to spend with her daughter. And, you know, it's not happening in Dubai. It's not happening because she's working in the U.S. It's happening because she lives in Antipolo and works in Ortigas. <laughs> and that is, that is a terrible thing because she really is like an OFW working in her own country. So she took the time to share her plight with the LTM Army. Right? And um, you know why? Because Ankas helped her cut the commute time by more than half, and she could now spend precious time with her daughter. And to take that away from Sam would have been unthinkable. And this is something that JICA or any other organization cannot put a better value on. Because this goes beyond economic numbers, this goes beyond productivity. This is, an, this, this is unquantifiable. 
and I consider an impact on every Filipino's quality of life. So we had a long journey. For those of you who don't know, you've had a, a glimpse of it on, on the video. We've been actually shut down twice by the government. Um, and you know, in the beginning, I couldn't understand why you know, this was the case. Why, why was this conflict between us? Because all we were trying to do was professionalize the Havel Havel service, uh, which has been around for some say 10, 20, even 40 years. Right, so Haba Habal is an informal motorcycle transportation service in the country. And what we were doing was to use technology to make it safer, giving background checks, giving training, giving insurance. Right? And and I, you know, so I, I couldn't understand it. But later on, as we dealt more and more with the government, uh, we realized that we were actually coming from the same place. So, you know, it was really us coming from two different perspectives, but both trying to solve the same thing, which is to help Metro Manila's traffic woes, while at the same time ensuring the safety of the commuters. So I have to say, it was not easy convincing the government that they were safe, um, and it shouldn't be, right? Because offering a service to the public should go to the gauntlet, and it should not be done with ease. Um, and the government should be skeptical, you know, when it comes to the welfare of its citizens. So, fun facts. There are 18 million motorcycles in this country. One eight. Anyone dare to guess how many cars there are here? Cars in the Philippines? How many? One million? Mm, yeah, one million close. <laughs> So there are 3 million cars in the Philippines versus 18 million motorcycles. But you see the traffic in EDSA because there's actually half of the entire car population is here in Metro Manila. That's 1.5 million cars. Um, and an SWS survey conducted last year, they showed that one out of three Filipino families own a motorcycle. Over 99% of them are from low-income households. And over half of them depend on motorcycles for their livelihood. Unfortunately, almost none of them went through proper training on how to ride a motorcycle. Right? So, you know, a lot of them learn from tricycles, but tricycles has three wheels, so you don't need to learn how to balance. Um, some learn from YouTube, some learn from their family members, some not at all. So, shockingly, but maybe not surprisingly, a lot of people ride a bike the first time when they take it out of the dealership. Um, and, you know, motorcycles are sold so cheaply in this country. For a down payment of 3,000 pesos, you can own a bike. But it's very competitive out there. So there's actually a lot of people giving bikes for zero down payment. And this has become the first big purchase of many low-income households. And it becomes the stepping stone of the economic progress. So, because we do not have any training facilities to train the bikers to facilitate these trainings, the results are disastrous. So, 53% of all vehicular deaths are motorcycle related. And 90% of those deaths are because of improper or low health and usage. This was a disconnect. The statistics that the government was seeing on how dangerous motorcycles were because of the lack of training, did not connect to the need and the dependence of the masses to motorcycles for the economic development. But we knew, regardless of what the government was saying and how dangerous motorcycles were, people did not care, right? They will ride a motorcycle to get them to work. They will use a motorcycle to earn them a living. They called this Louis Buhai. Loosely translated, this means every day I will risk my life on a motorcycle just to support my family. And because of this, it bolstered our resolve, Ankasa's resolve, to fix this disconnect, to bridge the gap between you know, the, what the government thought and what the masses would be doing anyway. But we had to be creative. 
right? Because uh, you know we have to look at traffic like how people like in a different lens, and we have to present what we were seeing in a different lens to people because statistics are boring. All right, I can tell you that you know Angus has a 99.997% safety record. We require all our bikers to go through training. They have their professional driver's licenses, you know, MDI clearance, police Morantai clearance. So like half of you in the room just fell asleep, right? <laughs> so let me share some of um, one of our favorite campaigns that we ran and how we did it. Choices. Whether it's so a single mom doesn't have to choose between her 